Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Gross, uh, and I'll be talking about PyTorch 2.0 and the uh, compiler in it. Um, this talk was originally prepared by my colleagues Justin and Siraj, uh, two excellent developer advocates at Meta. Um, but I will be presenting it because they were unfortunately not able to attend PyCon. Um, the work I'm going to be talking about is largely done by my colleagues at Meta and in the PyTorch community at large. Um, so to start with, how many people here by raise of hands have experience with AI or machine learning? Ah, that's a lot. Uh, how many of you use, have used PyTorch? That's a good number. Okay, so for those of you not familiar with PyTorch, it's a machine learning framework frequently used for training neural networks. Uh, it was originally developed by Facebook AI Research in late 2016. It's always been open source, and basically from the beginning, it's had contributions from both um, Facebook, now Meta, and um, collaborators in industry and academia. The project's now under the Linux Foundation, um, which the intention was to provide sort of neutral governance for it. Um, yeah. Uh, PyTorch has been, become fairly popular. It's probably the most widely used machine learning framework for AI research. Uh, this graph from Papers with Code shows the um, number of new papers released with code and by um, framework used. Uh, and that big orange segment in the middle is PyTorch. Uh, I think it's worth considering what made PyTorch popular. Uh, this is especially important question for PyTorch developers and maintainers because as we change and improve the framework, we want to make sure we adhere to the principles that helped it succeed in the first place. I think one of the most important principles at the beginning is that it's Pythonic. And this is a bit abstract and hard to define, but one way to put it, I suggest, is that PyTorch is not only written in Python, but it allows developers to use it in ways that they might be familiar with from other Python uh, libraries and frameworks. So for example, a lot of PyTorch's tensor APIs are pretty similar to NumPy's array APIs. And furthermore, PyTorch is interoperable with both NumPy and a lot of other Python libraries and frameworks. Um, again, it's a bit abstract, so it's both, I think, hard to measure and also hard for us as developers and maintainers to know what exactly it is that we want to maintain. But I'll come back to that a bit in a later, uh, later in this talk. I think another important reason for PyTorch's popularity is that it tries to really achieve sort of a Goldilocks balance between abstracting away low-level details that you don't really care about, but still providing an API that's rich enough to let you do things that might be slightly off the beaten path. Um, and finally, it's important that PyTorch is performant. Uh, so under the hood, it uses kernels implemented in C and C++, uh, C++ and CUDA to run on GPUs so that your, the neural networks that you train and run in PyTorch run efficiently. Coming back to the notion of what makes PyTorch Pythonic, a, I think a big reason here is that PyTorch really embraces sort of eager dynamic execution, uh, what some people call like an eager mode paradigm. One way to think about this is that every line in Py a PyTorch program is sort of executed in order with the rest of your Python program and it's mostly executed immediately. The other bit is that it supports dynamic control flow, meaning that your PyTorch neural network models can include if statements, while loops, for loops, all the sort of normal control flow that you'd expect in a Python program. And this stands in contrast a bit to some other frameworks that were developed around the same time in 2015, 16, and 17 that really focused on static data, data flow graphs. And what I mean by that is that they tried to or they do capture representation for your neural network that's independent of the rest of the Python program. One, uh, sorry, uh, one reason that um, a lot of frameworks embrace this uh, static uh, uh, data flow graph approach is that it provides a lot more visibility for the framework to know what's going on in your neural network model and potentially opportunities to, for it to optimize the execution, make it run faster and more efficiently. PyTorch, when we started the project, we intentionally did not go for this static data flow graph approach. Um, most of the, the original developers on PyTorch had previously worked on Torch 7. And the thing that people kept liking about Torch 7, there were a lot of other problems, but one of the things that people liked was that it was direct, that it was 
the program that you wrote executed essentially as you wrote it. It was a lot, which makes it easier to debug. So in switching back to PyTorch, in the context of PyTorch, the dynamic execution, the eager mode paradigm means that you can use standard Python debugging tools like PDB. You can interoperate with other libraries. And for a lot of developers and researchers, this sort of API feels more direct and easier to use. So again, I think in 2016 and 2017, the prevailing, prevailing conventional wisdom was that deep learning frameworks needed a static graph because they needed to be able to optimize the performance and potentially capture a program representation to run on upcoming new exciting hardware. And I think this view was both pre prevalent at Facebook, where I worked and still work at the time, and as well as more broadly in industry. But it wasn't universal. There's a bunch of other frameworks like PyTorch, including a number that came before it that also adopted this, or also focused on this dynamic, eager execution, among them Chainer, Torch7, which we had worked on, and Dynet. Again, I think the reason this prevailing conventional wisdom, uh, or this conventional wisdom was prevailing was because people thought that eager mode was slow, that your, the overhead of executing a Python program for every step of your neural network training or inference would be too much. That one is Python is, can be slow at times, especially compared to uh, optimized C++ or CUDA kernels running on your GPU. Um, and our hypothesis was basically that this overhead didn't matter, at least not then. One reason it didn't, we didn't think it mattered was that the most common way to train neural networks at the time, still probably true today, is on GPUs. And for your PyTorch or other programs, your, uh, the Python aspect of your program can run on the CPU while the vast majority of your computations are running in parallel or concurrently on the GPU. So as long as the Python bits of your program are fast enough to keep the GPU bits fully, the GPU fully occupied, then the Python overhead isn't going to matter. Um, and this was true, as, I think it was particularly true in 2016, 2017, and for the few years following it. But the problem was that GPUs kept getting faster, and they were getting faster quicker than CPUs were getting faster. So it became pretty clear that eventually um, the speed up in GPUs would mean that the CPUs weren't fast enough, that this overhead would matter because you couldn't keep the GPUs busy enough. So Basically, from shortly after the release of the first version of PyTorch, the team started looking into ways to add a compiler to PyTorch while still trying to keep the principles that I think made PyTorch successful and popular. Again, I think the most important principle that made PyTorch successful was that it was easy to use. And this was especially important, I think, for AI researchers um, because more so than people deploying or running inference or deploying models to production, AI researchers tended to have much more broader use cases and do things that would, might be less well supported by a static graph um, uh, paradigm. Of course, we still want PyTorch to be fast. So the goal was, can we build a compiler that pri prioritizes the user experience, particularly the developer experience of someone using PyTorch? Um, I think a lot of people think of these as opposing goals, the ease of use and performance, and that you're making a trade-off between the two. And in a lot of cases, you are. Um, but we really, to, for this project to succeed, we need to be both have something that is easy to use and perform it. And I think in practice, there's a lot more, like this, the design space isn't one-dimensional. It's not just performance and ease of use. There are other places in this uh, design space, different trade-offs you can make. And I'll come back to this later in the talk about the different sorts of trade-offs we made that are not strictly ease of use versus performance. So the PyTorch 2.0 API for the compiler is pretty simple at the user level. It's just torch.compile model. Get back a compiled model that you run, which is hopefully faster. Under the hood, it's doing a lot more. At a high level, it's basically doing three things. The first thing is graph acquisition, meaning it's trying to get a representation, representation of your program. Then it's doing graph lowering. It's trying to, given the operations that you write in your PyTorch program, it's trying to decompose those into operations that might be better suited for the compiler to optimize or generate code. And finally, it's graph compilation, both the optimization step and actually generating the code, either that's running on your GPU or um, on another device. Um, 
this diagram from Sumith's uh, keynote at PyTorch to, at the um, PyTorch uh, conference, I think, illustrates the three steps pretty nicely. So, as a developer of PyTorch, you write write a typical program that's doing a series of operations. In this case, it's a neural network convolution followed by a batch normalization op operation, finally followed by the uh, rectified linear unit. What these are doesn't matter terribly, but the important thing is you're writing a Python program, you have a bunch of these calls into the PyTorch API. The graph acquisition means that it's determining what these calls are and converting it into a data flow graph, meaning that the result of one thing flows into the other. And then it's a representation that the compiler knows how to handle. Some of these operations can be broken up into their constituent bits. So for example, the convolution operation in PyTorch is both really a convolution plus an extra addition at the end. And breaking those up might provide more opportunities for the compiler. And finally, the last step is basically uh, generating the actual code that will run on your GPU. So again, graph acquisition is basically trying to do that, acquire, like capture that static graph representation, the, the representation that's useful from the compiler from your dynamic program. Graph lowering is breaking it apart and graph compilation is both the optimization steps and generating the code for your device. This wasn't the first attempt that the PyTorch team had for adding compiler to PyTorch. We actually, it's the third attempt. The first one was torch.jit.trace, which work on this, I think, started around 2017, a few months after the first public release of PyTorch. The way the trace compiler worked was you, um, it, well, first it had a pretty simple API. Like torch.compile, it was you added a torch.jit.trace call around the thing that you wanted to compile along with a special, an input that you represented um, sort of a standard uh, input to your neural network model. The compiler would execute your model line by line and record or trace each of the PyTorch operations that uh, was required to execute the model. And those operations form a graph. One limitation of this is that it only works if your PyTorch neural network model doesn't depend on the input size. So for example, it might be common for like a, um, an image classification neural network model to only process fixed size images. But other applications, for example, uh, segmentation, like figuring out where objects are in an image, detection, same sort of thing, or even some language models have inputs that are varying in size. Like you might have, Im uh, excuse me, you might have images that are wider or shorter or bigger, and it might, you might want to keep those as the original inputs. And torch.jit.trace didn't handle these wells because it assumed that the input that you provided during compilation was the only shape and type of input that it would see. The second uh, attempt at adding a compiler to um, PyTorch was TorchScript. And TorchScript still exists in PyTorch as just torch.jit.trace. But um, to be clear going forward, we think that developers should prefer the um, torch.compiler, torch.compile in PyTorch 2.0 over either TorchScript or torch.jit.trace. TorchScript worked a bit differently. Instead of tracing the execution of your PyTorch program, sort of operation by operation, it would statically analyze your program and attempt to extract the graph um, just from static analysis. The other goal was that although torch.jit.trace ignored all the operations that were not PyTorch operation. So for example, if you had a for loop, it wouldn't really work. Or if you had, you know, normal sort of Python operations on lists or dictionaries, those wouldn't be captured by torch.jit.trace. TorchScript made an attempt to capture these operations. But this also meant that TorchScript kind of ballooned in scope to be more than just a PyTorch compiler. It also ended up being a Python compiler. Um, and this kind of split the effort of the team. The team ended up focusing a lot on trying to support more and more Python features because it's common for authors of neural network models to use you know, a little bit of Python features here and there. And in practice, it required that people that authored PyTorch models either refactor their code to avoid sort of unsupported Python operations or uh, calls into third-party libraries that TorchScript couldn't really capture. So Dynamo is our third attempt at a PyTorch compiler, and I think it's been fairly successful. 
It uh, also traces like torch.jit.trace, but with much better support for, I think, common operations. And one way it does this is by not really trying to be a compiler for everything. Um, our previous sort of attempts with torch.jit.trace and TorchScript really tried to capture the full program graph for your whole neural network. And one of the reasons for this was, um, one is people, I think a lot of people thought that you know, Python in production wasn't practical. Another bit was that I think there was a lot of interest in sort of running these models on uh, devices that weren't just CPUs or GPUs, um, either upcoming experimental hardware or um, TPUs or those sorts of things. And those things might not be able to support Python. So the previous attempts had these big efforts of trying to capture your whole program as a graph. And if it couldn't succeed, well, then it just didn't work. And that was a real problem because it meant that users had to change the code. Dynamo relaxes a bit this priority on whole graph capture. So while Dynamo still supports whole graph capture, that's not really a priority. And for the common use case, it supports um, having essentially breaks in your program. What that means is that if you have some Python operation or call into a third party library that the compiler doesn't really know how to handle, it just handles the first bit as one graph, it, the rest as sort of a black box Python um, call, and then the remaining PyTorch model as another graph. So you have this break in the graph and you can't really optimize across it. So potentially you give up some performance, but it means that it has much better um, compatibility. The other bit is that unlike uh, the original trace attempt, it uh, adds a lot of guards to your code to make sure that when things change, the compiler knows about it and that it can recompile if necessary. So for example, if your input sizes change, the program doesn't just fail, it you know, checks that the inputs change or the shapes change and recompiles the program. So again, you might end up giving up some performance when things aren't quite what the compiler hoped for or expected for in terms of extra recompilations, but you no longer give up, um, your program no longer breaks completely. The way this works is it uses the uh, frame evaluation API from uh, PEP523. Uh, this is, uh, excuse me, this is a chart showing, a uh, graph showing sort of the normal evaluation of a uh, Python function. So it involves both a Python code object, which contains the bytecode for Python, and the frame object, which contains the dynamic execution state. And the built-in Python interpreter uses these two things to actually execute your function. Dynamo sticks itself in between these using the frame evalu evaluation API. First, it takes the code object and analyzes that function um, to try and extract a graph of the useful operations. And the, the format of the graph is called uh, FX, which I think predates Dynamo. There's another compiler. In fact, there's multiple compilers uh, for uh, PyTorch 2.0, depending on what sort of device, GPU or CPU or other types of hardware that you're targeting. And uh, the compiler emits both sorts of the um, the code that's gonna be executed on, say, your GPU, as well as modifications to the Python um, code object. Uh, and these modifications are basically the guards we talked about, so that if the assumptions that the compiler makes, so for example, if your input changes size or shape or data type, the compiler is able to handle that gracefully by recompiling rather than either breaking or you know, giving you an incorrect result. And then finally, this patched objects are handled, handed back to the normal Python interpreter. So it's able to handle all the sorts of typical Python steps that might be part of your model that you know, aren't really captured by a PyTorch program, uh, excuse me, that aren't really part of the PyTorch API. Um, so that's the uh, PyTorch 2.0 compiler, not quite. There's the most important bits that I haven't talked about are all the things that happen after Dynamo. Um, one of these important steps that's part of PyTorch is ahead of time autograd. And what that does is, um, the mo is for training neural net for neural network trainings, excuse me, uh, it computes the, um, this, the PyTorch operations that will be needed to back propagate the loss through your model to actually update the weights in your model. And by doing this ahead of time, that's, uh, it's able to provide more opportunities for the compiler to um, optimize these kernels, avoid duplicate code, and that sort of thing. 
And the other really important bit is Torch Inductor. And this is, a, the, this is the part of the compiler that um, generates uh, the code that runs on your GPU. And Torch Inductor leverages um, OpenAI's Triton. I think that's, Triton's probably the other really important piece that made this uh, compiler a lot um, more flexible and easier to develop than previous attempts. One of the challenges with some of the previous attempts, especially Torch Script, was that large bits of the compiler were written in C++, and in particular, they were kind of messy in the way that they integrate into the rest of PyTorch. So it made it both harder for people who work on PyTorch full time to develop, but also it made it a lot harder for people to contribute. And Torch Inductor is a compiler written in Python, which makes it a lot easier both for um, full time developers of, excuse me, both for full-time developers of PyTorch, but as well as external contributors who might not be as familiar with the code base. Um, finally, I'd like to talk a bit about the results. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to avoid the feedback. Uh, so one of the reasons I think that this uh, effort was pretty successful, especially compared to previous efforts, was that early on, uh, the PyTorch team collected a comprehensive set of benchmarks, basically 80 models in the wild, and use this both for um, performance measurements, but as well as to make sure that the um, compiler actually works, that it really supports the code that people are writing in the wild. Uh, and I think the results as of a few weeks ago is about 93% of these models, of these 80 models, work out of the box without any changes. And I think the average speed up on an A100 GPU is about 43%. And one thing I want to talk about is that even though PyTorch 2.0 even though it's like a version increment, it's backwards compatible. Uh, you don't have to use torch.compile. Everything else works as it did before. All your programs continue to work. So if you've been using PyTorch, I really encourage you to download PyTorch 2.0, try it out, try out torch.compile. Um, let us know if you run into issues or if it works well. Uh, we're really interested in that. Uh, I'd also encourage you to consider contributing to PyTorch. It's open source, a lot of development effort from across the community. Uh, and yep, this is the, the contributing page on the GitHub. Um, finally, a few other resources. Uh, Sumith Grady gave a great keynote at the uh, PyTorch 2.0 conference, uh, and we have an active um, uh, discourse uh, forum on PyTorch, both for support at discuss.pytorch.org, but also on development of PyTorch itself at dev-discuss. Dot pytorch .org. Uh, thank you, and uh, these are a lot of links to PyTorch. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please use the microphone in the center of the room. Okay, I got a question for you um, about the optimizations, which is uh, when you were compiling your code bases, where did you notice um, in the code bases the biggest bottlenecks we're coming up, and how did you try to resolve that? Uh, unfortunately, I don't know. Um, mm. Yeah, although I have worked extensively on PyTorch, I have not worked extensively on the compiler, uh, and have only returned to PyTorch recently. Got so. it. Thanks, everyone.